Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, December 4th, 2014. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, Neil Walker from the Campaign for Real Ale, or CAMRA, joins us to talk about his organization's efforts to revitalize and preserve traditional beer styles and pubs in the UK. Neil will also answer your questions from Facebook and Twitter. If you're new to home brewing and would like to get into the hobby for the first time, check out our website, basicbrewing.com, where you can find archives of our audio and video podcasts and our DVDs to walk you through basic and more advanced brewing techniques. You can follow me on Twitter, and my username is basicbrewing, all one word. We also have a Basic Brewing Radio and Basic Brewing Video page on Facebook at facebook.com slash basicbrewing. We're in the Google Plus, too. And thanks again to everybody clicking on the Amazon.com associate link on our basicbrewing.com site, especially during this really busy holiday season. Whenever you think of Amazon shopping, think of us first and click on our ad on basicbrewing.com. It's on the right-hand side of the page there. It's a little Amazon logo. It won't cost you any extra, but you'll be helping us to bring you this show, and we greatly, greatly appreciate your support. You've been wearing it out the past couple of weeks. We also have associate links for Brew Your Own Magazine and the American Homebrewers Association on our site as well. You can find our Basic Brewing iPhone app on iTunes, our Android app on Amazon.com. We have a Windows phone app. We're on the BlackBerry podcast directory. We're on the Stitcher app. We are just everywhere. If you want to put a tip in our tip jar, some coinage in our guitar case, you can go to basicbrewing.com slash support. And thanks to everybody who's done so already. People are ordering our new Jumbo Combo from our website. This combo has uh, all four of our DVDs, our logbook, and our bottle opener, all at one low holiday special limited time price. If you uh, already have our stuff, the Jumbo Combo also makes a great gift for uh, a new brewer or someone who you think needs to be a home brewer. Check that out at basicbrewingshop.com. And uh, a reminder, it's time to get a logbook for 2015. Start the year fresh with a brand new logbook. Uh, it, another reminder, it's time to send in your homebrew disaster story for our annual homebrew disaster show. Every year, Steve and I get together and we read your uh, your disastrous stories uh, and uh, and reward you uh, for, for the best ones. This year, the show will actually fall on our January 1st episode. So we'll start off the year in a disastrous way. Uh, the Brew Hauler folks are back on board this year to donate prizes for this year's episode. Uh, we met them out at uh, the National Homebrewers Conference in June, and uh, they were they were disappointed that we kind of miscommunicated. They they love to uh, be a part of the disaster show, uh, so we just uh, it's probably my fault for we're getting t- in touch with them too late last year. But anyway, the the Brew Hauler folks are donating prizes for this year's episode. And uh, we'll probably throw in some some basic brewing stuff in there, too. So I'm setting Christmas Day as the deadline to submit your disaster story because uh, it's easy to remember. Uh, Steve and I will get together uh, early the week after to record the show. Let's take a quick look into the mailbag with uh, a non-disastrous letter. Ira writes in from Parts Unknown and says, I had a question about yeast and sour mashing. That came up after the Great Berliner episode last week, specifically with the very low pH of the sour mash, boil, and fermenting wort. Would the yeast still be healthy enough to harvest and repitch after a full sour mash fermentation? And would they still be viable and have retained enough of their original character to pitch into a non-sour mash brew, say a typical pale ale? Or are the conditions too harsh on the yeast and should it just be tossed? So I, I punted the question over to Mike Tonsmeyer, author of American Sour Beers, a book that uh, maybe you should get under your Christmas tree. Mike answered, uh, if the beer is lightly tart, no issue. But like a high alcohol or highly hopped brew, I hesitate to reuse the yeast from a highly acidic sour mash slash wort. You could likely build up a portion of the yeast in a starter to revive it, but Mike says harsh conditions could change the character of the yeast. If that makes sense. Uh, anytime the yeast is stressed out too much, 
uh, from any of those conditions that he talked about. It seems like uh, it'd be better just to get buy fresh stuff. Thanks to uh, Ira for the question and uh, Mike for the answer. We have a sponsor this week. This holiday season, give the gift of homebrewing. An American Homebrewers Association membership is the perfect stocking stuffer for fellow beer enthusiasts. What's more, if you purchase an AHA gift card before December 12, 2014, you'll receive a free gift. Choose from three popular brewers' publication titles. IPA by Mitch Steele, Designing Great Beers by Ray Daniels, or Radical Brewing by Randy Mosher. Visit homebrewersassociation.org to learn more. All three of those are great books. That's homebrewersassociation.org to learn more about that. Now, let's go on to our conversation with Neil Walker from the Campaign for Real Ale. Neil Walker, welcome to Basic Brewing Radio. No, thank you for inviting me along. I guess we should start with the uh, the easiest and most obvious question. What is real ale? Well, in terms of Camera's definition which of real ale, um, so we're the campaign for real ale, and how we define it is basically beer which is served from the uh, the vessel which it's fermented. Um, so obviously all beer undergoes a, a primary fermentation, which generally happens in the brewery, um, and real ale actually undergoes a secondary re refermentation, um, which actually happens in the pub. So it's delivered to the pub unfinished, and then it matures in the cask, and that's where it's it's second uh, fermentation happens um, and that's basically where it gets its, its carbonation so it's a much softer level of carbonation than you might expect with a um, with a forced carbonated beer um, which has kind of led to you know certain uh, people from other countries thinking it would be um, you know a flat beer but it's it's not flat it's um, it's got a carbonation but it's just much softer yes and in the past uh, uh, Britain has a reputation for having flat warm beer is that true <laughs> I think we're um, I think we're slowly shedding uh, shedding that image. Um, I think, as you say, you know, it is served ever so slightly um, warmer than you would than you would drink it in in America, but it's certainly not warm. Um, it's it's served as what's known as cellar temperature, so that's typically between about ten and thirteen degrees. Um, whereas a kegs beer would certainly be served generally between about six and eight degrees. Um, some pubs will serve, uh, you know, lagers much colder than that, but generally that's that's about right for something like an IPA. Um, in England, we serve it about 10 to, you know, 12, 13 degrees. Um, what that does, though, is it allows a beer which has been matured um, as a real ale, so it's been matured in the pub cellar um, as a cask beer. It allows certain, what's the best way to put it, certain nuances of flavour to come out which you might otherwise have got lost. So I think what British real ale does so well is you can have a beer which is, you know, four percent even you know less than four percent and actually it's got masses of flavor because the the temperature allows these kind of intricacies uh, to come out so you get a lot of complexity um for a lower abv which is really you know that that's where that's where real ale really shines and for for us americans uh that's around 50 degrees fahrenheit as the sweet spot um it, you know, over here in the United States, we have uh, our thriving craft beer movement, but we still have the, uh, you know, the vast majority of our beer that's produced over here is the yellow fizzy stuff uh, that the uh, the big manufacturers want you to drink as cold as possible. In fact, there's a beer called Coors Light that you may have uh, heard of, and, and I hope it's not available over there. But <laughs> it, No, it is. It is available over here. Yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not one that I would drink myself, um, <laughs> it's, um, but it is certainly available. Yeah, and that, well, I'm sure as you're about to say, that's one that's designed to be served even colder so you can barely taste anything. <laughs> right, exactly. In fact, they have the, uh, over here, they on the labels uh, and on the cans, they have uh, temperature-sensitive technology that where you know certain mountains show up on the can or something that show you uh that it's uh, safe enough to drink because it's so cold uh yeah no we, we have that over here as well i think we've probably got it a little bit later than you guys but we um in the last couple of years we have we have started to get that um i mean england you know the same the same as america and well the, the whole of the uk actually um so that's england scotland ireland and, and wales um it is still lager that dominates, um, but I think what's important to remember is that the overall beer market is actually it's in slight decline in the UK. So people are drinking less beer, but the the one area of the market which is actually growing, so the one area of the market that's outperforming the rest, is real ale. So it just goes to show that you know 
craft beer um, and real ale, which I think are you know in, intertwined in the UK and in America, um, are the ones that people are drinking. So I think people are drinking less, but I think they're drinking better. Um, when drinks are, you know, in England, we're probably paying around four, even five pounds a pint for a, a pint of beer in central London. Um, you want to drink something which is high quality, and I think that um, real ale and, and craft beer um, plays into that. You, you're not willing to pay that much for something which is mass produced and has no flavor. And that might lead us into the history of camera. Uh, how and, and when and why did it uh, come about? Well, camera's been around for, well, it's, it's about 44 years uh, this year. Um, it, it was originally set up in, in the 70s, basically as, as a reaction um, to the big breweries at the time, um, moving from a beer which was served traditionally, so it was, it was, it was served from the cask, um, generally in, in wooden casks, um, and the big breweries wanted to basically increase um, productivity. They wanted to use all the best modern technology that they could. So they, um, you know, they, they started to pasteurize the beer. They started to keg the beer, um, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, but, but the problem was that the the beer that they were doing was bad. The beer they were putting into kegs was not good. And then they were trying to sell this um, as a as a you know a brand new technology in what everybody should be drinking. Um, and it started to flood the UK. So you know. We always talk about kind of what needs red barrel and these sort of beers, which were everyone kind of cites as, you know, the worst ones at the time. Um, and it it really was those uh, that, that were the, you know, final nail in the coffin. And people said, you know, this this isn't good enough. We we need to kind of hold on to our traditional beers that have got more flavor. Um, these guys set up Camera, um, which was actually originally called uh, the campaign for the revitalization of ale. Um but it's a little bit too hard to say. <laughs> so um, they eventually changed it to uh, the campaign for real ale, um, which is where the term real ale came, pro- came from. Um, you know, if you look then, there was just a couple of thousand members. Um, we've now got 167,000 members. Um, so it really means that Camera is one of the biggest single issue consumer groups, well, in the world, but certainly in Europe. Um, in terms of beer groups, Camera's got massive influence, um, as well as you know, campaigning for pubs, um, campaigning for real ale. We also campaign for beer in general, so we're working on generic beer campaigns, you know, working alongside some of, some of the big brewers to kind of get beer uh, back into the public consciousness. Um, the thing that we really promote is obviously you know, real ale and, and cask beer, um, but we're not against anything. Um, you know, we're, not, we're not against keg beer, we're not against, we're not against lager necessarily. We're not against the big brewers, but what we're saying is that this is the thing that we promote. And this is the thing that, that we love, really. Um, so that kind of gives you a snapshot of how camera started and kind of what it's become as it's grown. I uh, solicited uh, questions out on Twitter and Facebook, uh, and uh, some of the responses I got from the Facebook page uh, ranged from Stephen Crosby saying, "Considering the the great British ales available, not in the U.S., why isn't camera a no brainer?" So there, <laughs> that's a that's a positive one, uh, and then uh, we got a couple of uh, negative ones. Dragos uh, Nastasi says, "What's the point of it? Is it to hold on to a tradition, kind of like Potter making clay pots with a man-powered wheel?" And Chris Taylor says, "Do you see a future for an organization stuck in the past, which considers the method of serving determines the quality of the beer?" So, so how do you respond to that? How do you respond to people that say that? Uh, you know, maybe you're maybe you're hanging on to something that you shouldn't be. Yeah, I think I think that the thing to remember is that you know, camera isn't about holding on to old technology um, which isn't viable nowadays. You know, it's, it's not like saying um, we're doing this because it's how it used to be done. We're actually doing it because it, we believe that the beer tastes better. Um, there's lots of different ways that you can serve beer, and you know, if you if you if you go up to Germany and you, you taste some of the um, the beers that they have there, the lagers and things like that, which which would suit car- you know being forced carbonated um, and would suit being kegged, um, then there's nothing wrong with that. And you know, actually, camera um, promote those styles of beer at their festival as well. Um, but if you taste a um, a British real ale, something which is you know perhaps three and a half percent or up to five percent, something like a best bitter um, or even a porter. Um, for me personally, you know, I think that does taste better um, served on cask. Um, we're not we're not saying that the, you know, the innovations in craft beer that are happening elsewhere in the market are bad. What we're saying is that you know we're here to to hold on to to this bit. We're we're saying that you know there's certain beers that really do taste better um, served as real ales, and it really is worth holding on to. I think sometimes it, it, it's hard to 
to explain to people who have only drank um, kegged beer. You know, I'm not sorry. I'm not, I'm not trying to you know pa- patronise your your listeners. I'm sure they've tried loads of different beers, but you know, there's certain beers which if you try that in a in a bottle, you might think, well, what's this? That that doesn't taste that that good. Um, but actually, if you taste that same beer, something like an English bit, if you tasted that on cask in really good condition, then you know it's a fantastic beer. Um, and I think that's what it's all about. It's a, it's about preserving something which really does um, deliver a fantastic beer into the glass. So it's not in the spirit of the Reinheitsgebot, uh, the German beer purity law that says beer is this and nothing else. No, abs- absolutely not. I mean, if you you know you come along to we we have hundreds of festivals all over the UK, but if you come to our biggest one, which is a great British beer festival, you know we have really unusual beers there. So you know, for instance, we had a um, a Welsh brewery who brought along a um, a bacon smoked chocolate beer last year. <laughs> you know, so that certainly wouldn't get past the uh, uh, the purity law. Um, it's not about stifling creativity. Um, it, it's it's just about preserving um, the thought that certain beers are served better like that, and that actually um, a beer can can taste better served on cask. Um, you know, there's nothing wrong with using American hops. There's nothing wrong with using different yeasts, using different malt bills. You know, in no way is it designed to stifle any creativity. And actually. The, some of the best beers and some of the most unusual beers um, are being produced by small breweries in the UK. Um, these micro brewers, really, really small. Particularly, I mean, particularly looking at this from a, an American perspective, some of the breweries um, which are producing fantastic beer in the UK are absolutely tiny. Um, you know, little ten barrel pa- plants, and we are not about you know stopping them producing whatever they want. Um, we're just about kind of promoting um, real ale and pr- promoting it to British people. Ryan Murphy on Twitter says, uh, where does camera come down on using non-traditional brewing ingredients? So, say, spices and sugars and, you know, bacon or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Um, it always makes me laugh when people ask about, you know, non-traditional. Um, because actually, you know, no, nothing's new in, in, in the beer world. If you go back 100 years, 200 years, they were using spices. You know, they were using orange peel. They were using coriander. They were using different types of yeast you know england was importing american hops and vice versa so it's, it's it's not nothing you know nothing new in the beer world actually and certainly camera um as i've just said with you know answering your last question um was certainly not there to stifle for creativity and we would you know we celebrate it if you, you go along to a camera beer festival there's going to be some unusual beers there and that's a really big draw for a lot of people um beer festivals and camera are about trying a range of different styles and a range of different uh, types of beer um, we also have kind of specialist categories in our um, in our national competitions. So, for beers which don't necessarily fit into a certain style, such as you know bitter or porter or stout or whatever the style is, um, we do have a specialist category. So that could be anything from you know an orange wheat beer um, served as a real ale, or that could be you know any anything really. Um, so we certainly do you know do support different types of beer and using unusual ingredients. I went to the uh, Great Taste of the Midwest. Uh, here in the United States a couple of years ago, and there was a tent dedicated to cask ales. Uh, and there was a lot of beer there and a lot of different styles, and uh, I got to try a couple of them. Uh, the danger of going to one of those things is that there's so much beer to try that you don't get to try everything that you want. But So uh, there is some enthusiasm over here as well for you know the cask-conditioned beers. Yeah, I, th- I, think, it's a, I think it's a growing, um, a growing thing in, in the U.S., um, I mean, I, I, I've visited the U.S. many times, and I, I've drank in, you know, craft beer bars. And there's some, obviously, when I'm over there, I'm, I'm interested in drinking um, American beers and, you know, the really hoppy IPAs and things like that, which the, the beers that you're famous for. Um, but certainly, there's, there's a growing contingent of people and craft beer drinkers, particularly within the U.S., that are interested in, you know, artisanal, um, really, really kind of interesting products. Uh, and I think that real ale ties into that. You know, it's it's the most craft of craft, isn't it? It's, it's, it's very small. It's very traditional. Um, it, it's quite difficult to do as well. You know, you've, you've got to hold your hands up with, with credit to, um, to pubs in the UK that can, that can serve a really brilliant pint of real ale. Cause it's difficult to keep that beer in good condition. Um, it's difficult to serve it at its, its optimum. Um, you know, that's the reason that beer started to be put into, ke- into kegs because it, it, it takes away the, the risk um, from the the pub not knowing what it's doing, um, and I think that's obviously going to be a problem in the U.S. as it starts to become more more popular in it as, as pubs start to to serve more real ale. Um, you know they've, they've got to be um, they've got to be trained and they've got to they've got to know how to serve it. 
Um, so yeah, that, you know, that, that's something which is hopefully going to grow in the US, and we, you know, we hope to see that as well. Matt Moore on uh, Facebook says, uh, "Is bottle conditioned beer <clears throat> considered real ale?" We as home brewers, you know, we uh, a lot of us bottle our beer and we put a little priming sugar in there with the beer. Um, theoretically, is would that be considered real ale as well? It is, yeah. I mean, we we have a um, we actually have an initiative over here in the UK which is called Real Ale in a Bottle, um, and basically that means that that breweries who commercially produce beer which is refermented in the bottle, so it's got it's got ye- live yeast in the bottle, and that's where it gets it f- its carbonation. Um, we actually give them a badge which they can put on their bottle, um, you know, directly into their artwork, and it's printed on the label, um, which actually says, camera says, this is real ale. Um, so we absolutely do support that, and that, you know, that's what we would refer to as real ale in a bottle. Um, we actually have a, a competition as well, which is specifically for these types of beers. Um, so if you go to the Champion Beer of Britain competition, which is the one that we run at our um, Great British Beer Festival, uh, there is actually a, a competition within that, which is specifically for bottled real ales. Um, so yeah, it's, it's certainly something which we, uh, we which we recognise. So we we home brewers are even more cool than we thought. Well, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the, you know the thing to remember as well is that you know I talked a little bit before about um, about the kind of small breweries and micro breweries in the UK and how they're leading you know leading the way with some really interesting beers. The vast majority of those brewers started as started as home brewers. Um, you know, you look at some of the, the the best breweries near where where I live. So you look at breweries such as um, the Colonel. You look at Weird Beard uh, Co., which is a quite a funny name, but uh, a good brewery. Um, and a lot of these brewers actually starting off in home brewing, um, and then you know moved into doing it professionally. So it's it really is a good way to kind of you know learn about beer and to really understand beer. That's that's common over here as well. I mean, I mean, you want you. There's something about standing around a a brew kettle and smelling that uh, the wort, uh, and envisioning the final product and and wanting to serve that to others that uh, that makes you want to do that for a living, uh, you know. And a lot of people are are doing that. Uh, fortunately, yeah. I think there's something inherently satisfying about producing something yourself and giving it to other people, whether it's you know cooking a meal or whether it's you know baking a loaf of bread or brewing beer. Then giving that to another person, and them enjoying that, I think that's you know inherently something which we all want. We all want to produce something and other people to enjoy it. Um, and I certainly, you know, when I when I've home brewed in the past with friends, and when you try that beer or when you give that to you know one of your family members or whoever, and they like it, I think there's something you know fantastic about that. So if you can do that as a business, then you know you've got the best job in the world, really, haven't you? Oh yeah, uh, and your workplace smells pretty darn good. Uh, <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> now, uh, let's get into a little bit of the mechanics. Talk about the mechanics of, of cask fermentation or, or re-fermentation. How does that work uh, for those who aren't familiar? Yeah. So basically, as a, as a beer is brewed um, in the brewery itself, so it's, uh, it's, it's left to ferment. The, the brewer adds yeast to it, which converts the, uh, the sugars f- – Let's start, I suppose let's start a little bit early. Um, in, in malt, there is starches, which, while it's been brewed, actually converts into sugars. And then that's what the yeast eats, uh, basically, to convert into alcohol and CO2, which gives the beer its carbonation. So that's in the brewery, and that's its primary fermentation. Um, then when it's put into casks, it obviously loses that that, uh, that carbonation, and it's re with yeast. So actually, they put fresh yeast into the cask, seal it up, and then it's delivered to the pub. Um, then it's maturing in the pub cellar. Um, the yeast goes to work on the beer again, and it gives it its, its fermentation um, for a second time, and that's what gives the carbonation to the finished beer. Um, obviously, you know, that's a kind of very simplified version of it. But basically, that's what ha- what's happening. Um, the, the yeast is, is breaking down the sugars in the beer and, and converting that into CO2, which is obviously carbonation, and also alcohol. Um, so that's what gives beer its, its alcohol and gives beer its, uh, its fizz or its carbonation. So what are the methods that uh, that brewers and pub owners uh, use to control the, the level of carbonation in, in these beers? Yeah, so I mean, in, in terms of the pub, what they do, they, they'll actually, um, you know, they, they'll have their valves on the, on, the, on the actual cask, which is basically a, a wooden bung or a, a soft bung, which is in the top of the cask. Uh, and they will release that if it's, you know, if, if it's, bubbling too ferociously um, the thing is about about a barrel of beer is that you, you're going to have a very small amount of space a small amount of headroom in there it's going to be fairly full of beer um, co2 is heavier than than air so 
if you let a little bit out and you open it for a little bit and, and tap it off, the air is going to be pushed out first, which is obviously the you know the enemy of beer. You don't want, you don't want to get air to your beer because that's what's going to make it go bad. So the CO2 will actually push the air out, and then they'll kind of put the put the bung back in. And it's it's all to do that. It's you know it's it's a very very difficult thing to do. And I'm I'm certainly not a an expert in um, in cellarmanship, um, but that's basically what they do is they, they they keep an eye on the on the on the barrels, they keep an eye on the casks, and they see how ferociously they're fermenting if they look like they're fermenting too quickly there's too much kind of um you know bubbling beer coming out of the barrel then they need to kind of release the pressure a little bit and that's what that's basically what they do um, and they'll keep checking it until it gets to a point where they think that that secondary fermentation is, is finished um, and then probably that day or the next day it's, it's going to be ready to serve so there's a bit of an art to it oh absolutely absolutely and it's it's something which it, which is tricky because as as real ale grows in the uk um as it becomes more and more popular what you will get is you'll get pubs which um which wouldn't have previously served real ale um wanting to have it because people kind of expect it nowadays one great example is, is hotels so lots of hotels want to have real ale because it's what the guests expect but it's very difficult to do because you don't really have a, a person that runs the cellar or, you, or sometimes you don't even have a cellar so it's it's quite difficult um and there's been some companies which have experimented with Things such as fast cask. Um, this is one thing which is an innovation, which basically means that it's got um, it's got beads in the beer which contain the yeast, so it means that you can serve it pretty much straight away. There's not kind of loose yeast in the beer; it's actually in these kind of beads, um, which gives it a secondary fermentation. But it also means that the, uh, the yeast drops straight away to the bottom of the barrel, and you can serve it straight away. So you can deliver it, turn it over, and serve it. Hmm. Um, normally, with real ale, it needs time to clear. Um, so if you if you you know, rolled a, a cask of real ale down the street, delivered it to the pub, stood it up and, and tapped it. It would come out very cloudy. Um, so as well as that secondary fermentation, you need time for uh, for the beer to clear and for the for the sediment and the yeast to, to drop to the bottom of the uh, the cask. Now, you since it's a naturally carbonated and you don't use CO2 to push the beer out, right? That's right, yeah. What are the mechanics of uh, serving? How do you get the beer out? So basically, I mean, what we're using in the, in the UK is we use a well, what, what we call a hand pull. Well, basically, it's, it's a beer engine, so it, it uses a, a suction capillary action. Basically, if we're going to get scientific, so on the bar you'll see the, the kind of old school traditional hand pulls, and what they're doing is they are, they're physically pulling the beer through with by air pressure or by suction, um, and actually, you know, no air or CO2 touches the beer, um, but it, what it does, it, it pulls it through the, the beer like a siphon, effectively, um, and what that means is that you're getting the beer direct from the barrel, it's not coming into contact with CO2, so it's not going to be additionally carbonated, um, and it's not going to come in contact with, with the air until it, uh, until it arrives in your glass, so you're going to hopefully um, get the beer at its, uh, at its best. Now, what's, the, what's camera's position on sparklers that are added uh on the tap to uh, agitate the beer as it comes out? Well, it's, it's a funny one, is sparklers, because um, it's a little bit of a, a north-south divide. So much like in America, we have um, we have a, a north of England, and we also have a south of England. I'm, I'm from the north, um, as any English listeners will be able to tell by my accent. Um, so we, we tend to prefer our beer sparkled, um, which means that you get a frothier head, um, you get a kind of creamier texture to it. Um, if you get a beer in London, if you get a beer in, in the south of England, they're much more likely to serve it without a sparkler, um, which means that you will get um, you'll get less of a creamy head. Um, and it's, it's kind of a, cl- a classic Yorkshire thing, really, um, to have a sparkler on a beer. Um, personally, you know, kind of putting um, the, the north-south divide aside for a second. Um, personally, I think it depends on the beer. You know, I, I personally really enjoy um, something like a porter or a stout served with a sparkler. Um, but if I'm if I'm drinking a really kind of hoppy pale beer, um, then I, I, you know I don't really mind either way, and I quite like it um, without that tight creamy head. Um, so in terms of camera, you know we, we don't have a hard and fast rule. Um, what we would normally do is we would either speak to the um, the brewer, so we'd find out what the brewer would uh, would like to do with their beer. Most most breweries will tell you, you know, serve this without a sparkler or serve it with a sparkler. Um, and then the second thing is up to the customer. If the customer, you know, wants a wants to be a sparkle, then that's that's their choice. You know, they're paying the money, so they get to choose. So you're you're standing firmly on the fence there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I personally I like sparklers. I I, I like beers to be sparkled. Um, but in in terms of uh, in terms of camera stands, yeah, it really depends on the on the on the brewer on the brewer. Sorry. Um, so some breweries, you know, will will have all of their beer 
um, non-sparkled and they, they will tell the all of their pubs, you know, don't put a sparkler on this. Other breweries will tell them to put a sparkler on everything. So it's, it's not so much us sitting on the fence. It's really, there's it's done differently all over the UK is what I'd say. Now over here, uh, typically what you'll see in a, in a brew pub or a, or a brewery is uh, the cask sitting up on the bar and the and the bar or the beer being served via gravity. Uh, is that done over there as well? It is, yeah. I mean, it's um, it, it again. That depends where you are. Um, quite often at beer festivals in the UK, so it's um, at some of the smaller camera beer festivals, beer will often be served by gravity, purely because for logistical reasons. So it's, it's very difficult to have you know. 300 hand pumps or 500 hand pumps um, for bar space, but you can quite easily have 300 beers uh, or 500 beers um, racked at the back, which you can serve by gravity. Um, so if you go to most pubs in the UK, they will they'll generally be served uh, via a beer engine, which means they'll be served, you know, on hand pull. They'll be pulled through at the bar. Um, it's, it's fairly rare to see beers being served by gravity, but, um, but it, it it does happen in, in some places. It depends depends where you are, really. But it's more often than not, nine times out of ten, it will be served um, via a hand pull. Now, I guess this is an area where probably uh, the critics of, of camera, at least over here, uh, the thing that they have the, the bone of contention with is, is that since these cask beers uh, are not pushed out by uh, CO2, uh, and the, there is air coming into the cask that is not replaced by, uh, you know, CO2, which would preserve the quality of the beer over time. Uh, ca- cask ale is a fairly short-lived product. I mean, it, it, it goes stale. So, so is that true? I mean, it is true, yeah. So, I mean, the cask ale is a, a living product. It's, it's a living thing. So, we, generally, once it's once it's at its peak, once the the pub has decided that it's ready to serve, realistically, you, you know, you're only going to get two to four days out, out of that cask of beer before it's going to start to not be at its best. Personally, I mean, you know, well, not even personally, but that in terms of where cameras stand on things, that's not necessarily a bad thing. You know, you can go and pick up a mass produced. Um, loaf of bread which will last for three weeks but it doesn't mean it's going to taste better than, than a bread that you've got from the bakery down the road which last only last a day or two days um, I don't think shelf life is is the best way to look at something which you're going to eat or drink personally <laughs> um, I think that if it, if it tastes better and it lasts less time um, I'd rather have something like that than something that will last for longer but doesn't taste as good um, so yeah it, it, it is a beer that's designed to be drank fresh but a good real ale pub, um, a pub which has got a good throughput of, of, of beer and a pub which has you know plenty of customers and also a cellarman that knows what he's doing, you shouldn't be getting a bad pint because um, generally a cask will come on and it, it'll be gone within a day or two days. And that is generally the case in a good cask beer pub. Um, so, yeah, it does it does definitely have a shorter shelf life, but if, uh, if it's a good pub, then it doesn't last very long. So uh, let me play devil, devil's advocate here. What's the, what's the sin of not putting a sort of CO2 uh, or, or of putting a, a CO2 rebreather on the cask that is at uh, atmospheric pressure, so you're not putting in additional carbon di- or, or carbonation, uh, but you're just replacing the air in the cask with CO2 as it's being served in order to preserve the beer? Um, I think, well, to be honest, it's, it's quite a technical one, but my understanding of it is that there's still going to be some dilution of that CO2. Um, so you go, you're still going to get some CO2, you know, unnatural force carbonated CO2, whatever you want to call it, um, dissolving into the beer, even if it is just, you know, filling the headspace. Um, you're still going to get some some of that dissolving into it. Um, that's kind of as I understand it. Um, I think really what the issue is, is that it's it's a slippery slope and it's, it's very close to being force carbonated. I think that's the real issue, um, is at the moment it's, it's very clear what's real ale, what isn't real ale, and, you know, putting putting carbonation into the, the headspace, which was previously filled with beer, um, is a little bit too close to to kind of force carbonating the beer. So it'd just be too, it'd just be too difficult to have a, a definition of, of whether it's real or not at that point. Um, and I think that's probably what, what the issue is. Um, but, yeah, it kind of goes back to the, the fact that, you know, what if that, carbonation does get dissolved into the beer um that's probably not the most technical of answers but i think that's that's probably the honest one that's a good one <laughs> i think you're right i mean i think uh, you know uh if it's exposed to 
a certain, you know, and somebody will write in telling me that I'm wrong, but, uh, but uh, that seems to make sense to me. I'm sure there's a few things which I've, which I've got wrong throughout this. I'm not going to worry too much. <laughs> <laughs> so there's always somebody that knows more about brewing than myself, certainly. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, as I, that's, as I understand it, understand it anyway. Now, along with the protecting the beer itself, a, a big part of the mission of camera is protecting pubs. Uh, and I have a couple of pub, pub related questions here from, from Twitter. Neckbeard Beer uh, says, why do the barkeeps at a pub in the UK think it's strange to smell the beer? They thought I was nuts. Well, I, w- I would, reading the camera website, I would, I would think that you, you wouldn't think it was nuts to, to smell your beer. I mean, I wouldn't. No, <laughs> I think um, I think it depends what pub you go into, um, and I think if you know, if you go into to, to pubs which are known for their beer and which are known for the you know the enjoyment of beer um, or the range of beer, whether it's lots of real ales or whether it's you know in bottles of beer from around the world, um, I think that they wouldn't be surprised about you smelling your beer. And you know, smelling beer is a massive part of tasting beer. You can't taste without smelling. So, I don't think publicans in in uh, Proper beer bars would be would be surprised by that, but certainly if you go into uh, one of the spit and sawdust boozers, then they might be a little bit a uh, little bit surprised. <laughs> uh, you talk a bit about the uh, the legislation uh, that you're involved in uh, lobbying for to protect uh, the traditional pubs. Uh, what challenges are traditional pubs uh, in the UK facing? Um, well, there's a number of different things, really. I mean, as you sort of mentioned, camera uh, promote pubs in general, and we want to protect pubs. And there's a number of ways which pubs are under threat at the moment. Um, one big thing for us is that actually pubs are not in their own use class uh, from a planning permission point of view. So um, I'm not sure what the system is in America, but in the UK, certain buildings have planning permission. So if, you, if you've got that building um, and you want to convert it to some, something else, then you have to have planning permission. That basically means that people in the local area get to have a say on whether that should happen or not. Um, at the moment, you can actually convert a pub um, into, a, into a supermarket. You can co- convert it into a shop or a restaurant, um, or you can actually demolish it um, without applying for planning, planning permission. So it means that a valued local pub, which is being used by people, which is popular, um, which the community wants to keep, they actually have at the moment, they have no say in what, what happens to it in certain certain instances. Um, and it's really dangerous because what it means is that actually you can have a pub which is really valued by a community and it, it can close and then be demolished the next day. Uh, and once a pub's gone, um, it, it's gone forever. Um, so they very, very rarely become pubs again. Um, it really is very damaging. We, do, we don't want any more pubs to be closing. Wow. And why? Why, why, is it, uh, why are pubs so important in the culture? I mean, I think I think pubs are a massively important part of, of, of what makes Britain. I think when people you know visit Britain, the first thing they want to do is visit a British pub. Um, it's, it's ingrained in our culture, and that they're so important, you know, to Britain. Um, we did some research um, last year, which basically t- asked people what they felt about pubs, uh, and it actually said that um, I think something like sixty-seven percent of people said that a well-run community pub. Um, was as important to them as a community centre or a post office. Um, I don't know if you have post offices in, in, in America, but it's, it's, it's a very important part of a village. And, you know, if, if, if you've got a village or a town or whatever and the post office closes, that's a pretty big blow in the same way that if a community centre closes, that's a, a big deal. Um, so that's, you know, they're the kind of buildings that people put pubs next to. Um, they're really, really important, and it's clear that people want to keep them. Um, but we, should, we need to use them more. Uh, Nicholas Vaught on Twitter asks, what steps can bars make to reinvigorate a sense of community, a bar as a meeting place with public discussion? I think that's a really good question. Um, and I think that there's there's lots of ways that they can do it. We did a thing last year which was called Community Pubs Month. And it's basically celebrating pubs which really get involved in their local community. So whether that's inviting them down um, you know, for, for discounted meals for senior citizens or whether it's organizing charity fundraisers or whether it's something as simple as having kind of tea and coffee mornings. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't all need to be about alcohol. You know, having tea or coffee mornings for, for mothers so they can bring their kids along and they, the kids can kind of watch a movie and they can have a tea or coffee. Opening your pub up earlier, you know, perhaps not serving alcohol at that time, something like that. There's loads and loads of ways that pubs can um, can develop and can, can get their local community involved. 
Um, we've got some some interesting examples in the UK where you know I mentioned local shops and how important they are to to small villages and towns. There's instances in the UK where the the local shop or, or the post office is closed and the pub has actually filled that gap. So it's it's become a shop and it started serving. Um, or selling kind of local produce, that's selling milk, bread, these sort of things, and actually becoming a post office as well. So you can, you can go to the pub, you can have a beer, and then you can buy a loaf of bread and some milk, and you can post a letter all in the same place. This, you know, this, this is happening. Um, it's not happening in every pub, but certainly there's, there's examples out there. Um, it's really important for any pub to know what their local customers want, um, to, to know what their local community want, and to react to that is the same as any business. Um, if your local community um, is lots of families, then you know you need to be thinking about offering offering food, um, being open to having children there. Whether that means having you know play area, safe play area, something like that. Um, it's all about reacting to your local community and giving them what they need. Um, because if you do, then they w- they will come. It's sort of in the uh, the the spirit of the original term, which I think was public house, right? Isn't that where pub comes from? That's correct. Yeah, it does come from public house. I've got one one more uh, question or one more area that I want to get to, uh, and it's inspired by uh, a listener called Patrick. He says, I lived in Fort Worth, Texas for some time and sampled many American-style beers. I especially enjoy pale ales and remember Dale's Pale Ale fondly from my time in the States. I, I imagine my delight imagine my delight when I saw the beer for sale in a small homebrew slash craft beer store in London. I bought a 12 ounce or 355 milliliter can and sampled the beer. Unfortunately, it was not what I remembered. The bitterness was much subdued, and those piney resinous flavors from the American hops, which I love, were not there. I looked on the bottom of the can and discovered it was approaching six months in age. So, what is the what is the impression of of American craft beer over there? And, uh, you know, from a camera perspective and from a personal perspective, and and is it well taken care of? I think it is. I, th- I think it's um, I, th- I, mean, I think I think American beer has got a fantastic reputation in the UK. Uh, and I think that actually, you know, some American craft beers which have made their way over here have actually, you know, got some new people into into the beer market that perhaps wouldn't have been there before. You know, I'd much rather see somebody drinking a pint of Sierra Nevada Pale Ale or, or Brooklyn Lager, which are the kind of the big craft Amer- American craft brewers that have made their way over here. I'd much rather see them drinking that than drinking uh, a mass-produced lager. Because if they're drinking that, they're drinking for flavor, uh, they're drinking the beer because of how it tastes. And then they're much more likely to try, you know, something like, like a traditional real ale, which is obviously what camera promotes. Um, I think American beer and craft beer has, has had a huge influence in the UK. Um, you know, there's, there's brewers over here which are definitely influenced by America. You know, you've got breweries such as uh, Magic Rock Brewery, um, to a certain extent the Colonel Brewery in London as well. Um, and these are breweries which produce predominantly American styles. So they produce a lot of pale ales, really hoppy pale ales, um, and then kind of stronger porters and imperial stouts and things like that. Beers which have been really popular in America and have been really important to the American craft beer scene. Um, they're now being brewed more and more in the UK, uh, and certainly they're inspiring brewers. I think it's it's for me it's quite strange because when you when I went to America, I, I was just shocked by how how little um, British beer was over there, uh, and the stuff that does make its way over um, was probably not the stuff which um, which we would call our best beer. Um, as much as we're getting the you know the big breweries, so we're getting stuff from Lagunitas, we're getting things from Brooklyn, um, a little bit from kind of Stone and you know Dale's, as it as he mentioned there. Um, these are still in the kind of specialist shops. So if you go down your normal pub, um, you're probably not going to get an American craft beer, but that that is starting to change. Um, some of the kind of big pub companies, such as um, Weatherspoons and some other companies, have started to really embrace American craft beer. Um, so the likelihood of getting something, I don't know, something maybe like Goose Island IPA um, or even like an Eater's IPA to a certain extent um, is massively increased. Um, so I think there is more people being exposed to it. And I think it does have a very good reputation. It's certainly certainly inspiring brewers over here as well. I would I would love to see more uh, craft beers from, uh, from over in your area over here as well. So uh, maybe as time goes on, uh, you know, things will flow back and forth uh, equally. I think absolutely. I mean, I, I think I think the beer world, you know, it's, it's very it's very easy to look at the beer world as, as being very segregated. But actually, you know, we've been swapping beer for hundreds of years, really. And you know, you look at you look at um, it's quite interesting to see 
Britain. So you, you'll now see a, a British cask beer or a British bottle beer or whatever it is, and it will say American style IPA, which which is quite an interesting thing really when you think about the history of that beer style. Uh, and you're looking at it was it was a British beer style. It was obviously brewed um, well India Pale Ale, as I'm sure lots of your listeners will already know. So it was a beer that was brewed um, to kind of survive the the long trip over to over to India um, to be drank by the British Raj. Then when the American craft beer movement started, they kind of picked up on this style and, you know, really ran with it. So you had beers which were massively hot, but had this huge resinous pine flavor or kind of citrus flavor. Uh, and then English people kind of drank these beers and English brewers drank these beers and said, wow, you know, we should be producing something like this. Uh, so now you'll get English beers produced in England um, called American style IPA, which is um, which is quite interesting. But it's, it's just um, for me, I, I like the fact that, uh, you know, Beer is not a closed world. We're, we're we're swapping ideas all the time. Well, this has been fun, uh, and I can't uh, can't get away without thanking Stephen George, the listener who helped uh, facilitate this whole thing. No, absolutely, thanks for uh, putting us in touch, Stephen. Yeah, and uh, I hope one day to to sample some real ales uh, straight from the source. Uh, it's one of my goals to go over into to England and to, to Britain and and uh, to to find out what it's all about. Absolutely. You have to come along to the Great British Beer Festival. That's the best place to try it. Excellent. Wait, oh, and by the way, when is that? And where is that? Uh, that'll be August. Um, so it's it's in London. Um, I think next year it runs from the I think the 12th to the 15th of August. Um, but it's um, if you want to have a look, it's gbbf.org.uk. Excellent. Thank you, Neil. Brilliant. Nice speaking to you. Well, thanks again to Neil. I learned a lot. It was a good conversation, especially um, that camera is more open-minded than a lot of us give them credit for being. So there you go. London in August sounds like a fun time. I bet there are a lot of amazing uh, real ales and casks then. Maybe one day. Maybe one day. In the meantime, if you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com. Or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com, and please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Check out our support link where you can throw a couple of bucks into the tip jar by subscribing financially to our podcasts. Be sure to check out our DVDs, Extract Brewing and Partial Mashing, Stepping into All Grain, Low-Tech Lagering, and Decoction Mashing, and Introduction to Wine Kids. You can find them all on our site. And for a limited time this holiday season, check out our Jumbo Combo with our DVDs, all four of our DVDs, our bottle opener, and our brewer's logbook, all at one special low price. You can check out our shirts in the store, too. You can see a listing of the fine folks across the country who sell our DVDs on basicbrewing.com, and if there isn't a vendor in your area, you can order them online in our online shop at basicbrewingshop.com. And uh, as I said at the beginning, thanks to everybody who's continued to click on our Amazon.com link, especially during this busy, busy holiday season. We greatly appreciate the support. Our featured products this week that were purchased through the link are A Feast of Ice and Fire, the official Game of Thrones companion cookbook, and Craft Cocktails at Home, Offbeat Techniques, Contemporary Cloud... <laughs> not, not clown pleasers, but the good, you know, contemporary crowd pleasers and classics hacked with science. Not saying that cl clowns wouldn't enjoy a nice craft cocktail. Thanks again, everybody. And remember, <laughs> I can't tell who bought what's. So no worries there. Just click on their Amazon.com logo on our site the next time you feel like Amazon shopping. We greatly appreciate your support. It's time for lunch. Don't forget you can also join the American Homebrewers Association and subscribe to Brew Your Own Magazine through the associate links on basicbrewing.com. That's all until next time. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer, production help for Basic Brewing Radio, and our website is provided by Kelly Dots. And Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long. <laughs>